so moving on to the speakers, um, we've got two speakers tonight, as usual. We've got Lucy Mather and Jamie Ribbons. We're just going to um, introduce Lucy to start with. Um, Lucy um, is the project officer for My Local Catch, uh, which is a marine conservation project in Whitehaven on the Cumbrian side of the Solway, which aims to raise awareness about local marine life and the importance of sustainable fishing. So their work involves lots of different activities, including running workshops for schools and youth groups, organising community events along the Cumbrian coast, promoting local sustainably caught seafood to businesses and restaurants, and also working with fishermen to transition from trawl fishing to creeling or potting, which is much less damaging to wildlife. So um, she'll tell you a little bit more about some of that, I'm sure. So I'm going to um, hand over to Lucy. So Lucy, whenever you're ready, feel free to turn on your camera and mic. And is this by magic? Here she is. <laughs> Hello. I'll just share my screen with you all and present here. So it's so lovely to have you all with us. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the marine wildlife in the Solway and then I think Jamie will go on to talk about some of the estuarine and freshwater life. Um, and I work for Cumbria Wildlife Trust on, as Naomi said, a project that's all about promoting sustainable fishing. So this is me, hello. Um, my local catch is based in Whitehaven and it works with a range of different groups and um, businesses and all that kind of thing to promote sustainable fishing and raise awareness about um, community wild, uh, <laughs> about local wildlife. Um, so that comes in a lot of different forms. We run events for the community, so lots of different things such as rock pooling, sand sculpture competitions, um, cooking events, all kinds of different things to help people connect to their coast and understand their coastline better. We also work with restaurants and businesses to help them improve their supply chain and help them source local sustainable seafood and methods that they're really confident won't be damaging wildlife. We work with schools and youth groups and a big focus of the work there is about reintroducing seafood as a part of the kind of cultural awareness in those areas so lots of people in coastal towns often don't actually eat that much seafood so a big part of the helping local fishing industry to thrive is helping local people to understand more about how to source and prepare seafood and then we are linked to something called the Cumbrian Creel Project which is all about helping um, the local fishing industry to transition from trawling to creel potting and other selective methods which are better for wildlife for reasons I'll talk about a bit later. So wildlife doesn't just work in isolation, it's part of a project called Living Seas Northwest which is a collaborative project between Cumbria, Lancashire and Cheshire Wildlife Trusts and it works across the areas shown in blue in the top left there um, and what that means is we can join up all of our marine work because the sea doesn't really care where the county boundaries are and we can be much more effective in our work in research and monitoring, in policy and advocacy and in community engagement projects such as mine and other ones that we have based all down along the coast. So the focus of my part of the talk today is the marine wildlife in the Irish Sea and I've got a couple of pictures here of just a few of my favourites before I start. So up on the top left is the jewel anemone and these are these beautiful little really delicate anemones that you get on rocky reefs down on the seabed um, and they've got these lovely little kind of teardrop tentacles which I just think are so ethereal and they look like a sort of candle on a Christmas tree. And then at totally the other end of the scale we have a picture here of a humpback whale diving back into the sea and this is kind of the ridiculous scale of things that you do get coming into the Irish Sea and the Solway Firth. Um, so I'll talk later about some of the kind of large megafauna that we have coming through as well. And then of course it wouldn't be one of my talks without talking about my lovely little rock pool creatures. So um, down in the bottom corner there is a picture I took of some starfish and some anemones and all these kind of really sweet little creatures you can find all along the Cumbrian coast. So the habitats in the Solway Firth are super varied. We've got kind of rocky shores, we've got mud, we've got kelp forests, We've got all kinds of different things. 
So I'm going to talk you through a few of the different habitats and the wildlife which lives in them. And I'll start with rocky reefs. So rocky reefs are where you have kind of sections of rock, which we, we would usually refer to rocky reefs as subtidal, so under the waves. And all of the little crevices in the rock create really interesting niches for lots of different wildlife to latch onto. And that then creates a whole ecosystem of prey and predators and interactions. So a few of the species that I've got shown here in the top left, is the light bulb sea squirt and these are really sweet little um, creatures that sort of suck in the water and filter all the nutrients out and blow it out again and they're, they're very sweet and delicate. We also have um, dead man's fingers which are a type of soft coral so similar to the corals that you would picture out in the tropics um, but we have them here they're kind of slightly softer squishier and the reason these ones are called dead man's fingers is because they look like sort of fingers poking up from the sea bed. So a little bit gruesome but very cool to see. Um, I also have a picture here, here of a sun star which is a type of starfish and we actually have seven different types of starfish present in the Irish Sea, most of which you'll also find all the way through the Solway Firth um, and they all have different niches so some of them like the reefs, some of them like the rock pools and the intertidal zone, some of them like the subtidal mud um, and I just think it's really interesting to show kind of the variety that all these different niches create. And then that other photo of the squat lobster is I think just my favourite wildlife photo we have. It's a squat lobster trying to have a little fight with some enemies presumably because one of them tried to grab it or it just got spooked or something but all of these crevices in the rocky reef are really brilliant for loads of different crustaceans because it's places that they can hide from predators but also hide from their prey and use them to hunt so it's a really dynamic ecosystem. In similar kind of environments to the rocky reef you'd also get kelp, kelp forests so kelp is a type of macroalgae or seaweed um, and they have a really strong holdfast which is kind of an anchor that latches onto the seabed and what that means is there's kind of different places in the kelp that provide different habitats for various species so down at the holdfast you'll find things like sea urchins and stalk jellyfish and actually the soft corals that I talked about earlier can be found in these kind of environments too and then on the leaves themselves you'll get grazing species so the pictures I have down in the right hand corner are of um, two little sea snails, one of which um, is one of my favourites, it's the blue red limpet. Um, and these will live on the kelp it itself and eat it. So sometimes when you find pieces of kelp washed up, they've got these little holes kind of nibbled away in them. And that's from these sea snails. And then because it creates this wonderful complex habitat with loads of different life, they become brilliant hunting grounds for marine mammals like seals and also loads of other predator species. So it's a really fantastic diverse habitat and it's also a brilliant blue carbon store. It wouldn't be a marine conservation talk without me talking a little bit about some of the megafauna, so that's the kind of large scale species that we quite often think about as like your whales and your dolphins and your sharks um, and again there's an enormous variety of wildlife that we get coming through the Solway Firth and I think people are often very surprised how much wildlife we get coming through. So I'll start with the cetaceans, these are always everyone's favourites and um, the pictures I have here of harbour porpoise, um, bottlenose dolphins and I believe that's a picture of a pilot whale but forgive me if it's a fin whale because I did have both pictures originally and had to choose one. <laughs> um, so bottlenose dolphins are fairly common coming through the estuary. I've seen them in Whitehaven many times and they're always really dramatic creatures. They love kind of jumping about and showing off. And um, yeah, they're always really lovely to see. We also get lots of different other dolphins coming through. So we see common dolphins, we see Rizzo's dolphins, um, lots of different cetaceans. The reason I've included harbour porpoise in here is partly because they're one of our most common sightings, but also very excitingly, there's sort of anecdotal evidence that Allenby Bay is a carving ground for harbour porpoises. So we quite often see harbour porpoises with their calves there. And that's an area of research at the moment into whether it is and whether there's anything additional we can do to protect them there. Um, the other three species here are kind of linked. So they're all a bit seasonal in when they come in. So the jellyfish tend to come in the summer and they'll come because of these um, plankton blooms. So sort of 
lots of algae being produced in the summer because of the, the warm air and the lots of photosynthesis. Um, so the jellyfish come to feed on that, as do the basking sharks. And the basking sharks have these huge cavernous mouths that they kind of drift through the water and filter out all of the nutrients in the water. And then the jellyfish themselves attract other species that come to feed on them. So the photo at the top is a leatherback turtle, and these have a really special circulation system in their legs that allows them to be in much cooler water than the sea turtles that you might know of kind of down in the tropics. So that's some of our big wildlife. On a much, much tinier scale, something that's really special about the Solway Firth is the biogenic reefs. So the pictures shown in the middle here are of the honeycomb worm reef, um, or as it's sometimes known, Sabellaria alveolata. I might have said that wrong, I'm not very good at Latin names. <laughs> um, and each of the tiny holes in these reefs is a tube, and these tubes are created by these tiny little worms about a couple of inches long, and they build a tube around themselves out of a combination of mud, sand and mucus, and they do that to protect themselves from predators and also from the elements. Whilst the tide is out, they'll kind of roll up a little ball of the mud sand things and block the entrance so that they don't dry out and they're not exposed, and then when the tide comes in, they'll come out and they sort of poke out the end and, and grab things from the water to eat. And the reefs that are created by these species are an amazing habitat for loads of different wildlife because it creates all these little crevices and niches just like with the rocky reef that different animals can live in and shelter in and um, yeah it's a really lovely habitat. Other species that do this kind of reef building include the mussels, which you might have seen on kind of harbours or all over the beach at Allenby Bay, actually, there's all these tiny, tiny mussels. Um, and also I've included the razor clams in here because they sort of do lots of things to build structure into the sand um, and are kind of shell building species in the same way the mussels are. And we have some really special areas of them in the Solway Firth. I think probably the thing that the Solway is most famous for in terms of wildlife, certainly the thing that I knew it for before I worked in this, is the overwintering birds. So every winter around 120,000 um, different bird species will spend the winter in the Solway Firth and an enormous proportion of these are waders, so they use the mudflats and the intertidal sediments, so that's the, the mud and sand in between the high tide and the low tide, um, as really rich feeding grounds to keep them going through the winter before they fly away to somewhere else again in the summer. So the kind of things you might find in this like mud and sand is little shrimps, worms, um, bivalves, so that's shells which have kind of two halves open in the middle and in the centre is a, a soft muscular creature that filters the water through and gets nutrients from it. Um, and just a few of my favourite of the waders that will come and use these mud flats are on the right. So they feed in very different ways. The oyster catcher has a strong beak, which it uses to either prise open or kind of peck three different shells and get the creatures in between. Whereas the sanderling, which is down at the bottom, will you'll see them along the beach and as a wave recedes, they'll run forwards and they'll eat up all the shrimps and things that have been exposed. And then as the next wave comes in, they'll run away again. So it's quite difficult to identify wading birds, with the exception of the oyster catcher, lots of them just look like a small grey bird, um, but quite often the way that you would identify them is by behaviour. So if you see birds sort of lined up along the shore, backwards and forwards with the waves, that'll be a sandling. Amazing version of um, the intertidal sediment is subtidal sediment and this is something that the Irish Sea is fantastic for. It has these vast areas of subtidal mud and subtidal sand and these support lots of different creatures, some of which I've pictured here, but there's such a diversity that I couldn't show you every picture. If you include all of the infauna, so the species which live within the sediment, then there's as much life in the subtidal mud as there is in the tropical rainforest. It's incredibly abundant, incredibly diverse. Um, and part of the reason for this is this creature that I've shown at the bottom. So this is 
uh, nephrops, or as you might know it, langoustine or scampi, or if you fish in Scotland or the Northwest, they're quite often just called prawns, um, but they're actually a type of lobster and they build burrows which create this really complex structure within the subtidal mud and allows oxygen to penetrate into different layers of different wildlife. A few of the other species we have here are brittle stars on the left, which you'll find in kind of vast aggregations. I've had people tell me before it looks like they're an invasive species because there's just so many of them, but they are native and brittle star beds are really like one of the biggest wonders, I think, of our marine life um, and if you do diving you might have seen them and they're, they're really beautiful um, and then also whelks giant sea snails there's sand stars and another type of starfish and the sea potato down in the bottom right which is a type of heart urchin and lives a little bit like the sea urchins um, that you might have found in rock pools and that kind of thing um, but obviously on subtidal sediments So what threats do these species face? Um, there's lots of different threats which different species um, face and different habitats face, um, but lots of them apply to many. So pollution will affect species like dolphins and sharks and seals because they might get entangled in it, but it'll also affect filter feeders because sort of pollutants or microplastics will end up getting into their tissues as they filter through all of the um, water. Invasive species can cause challenges in lots of different ways from kind of increasing predation and meaning that more of the small creatures get eaten up and it affects the food web to changing the habitat. So for example, Pacific oysters can take over mudflat areas and make them into a hard reefy kind of structure, which is then different and pushes other species out. But I think one of the really big challenges and one of the things um, which we're trying to help at Cumbria Wildlife Trust is unsustainable fishing. So there's been research and it's been shown that the more you overfish a system, the less it's able to support the animals higher in the food web. So you'll still end up with kind of lots of smaller creatures, but you'll lose the big predator species like dolphins and seals and sharks and those are the ones which really do need um, kind of a, a healthy and complex and thriving ecosystem to survive. So when we talk about unsustainable fishing, there's three key things that we like to try and address. So the first is bycatch, and this is where wildlife other than the species that you are trying to fish get caught as well and end up getting hurt or killed. It also refers to when you've kind of caught an enormous amount of fish unselectively and then you're only actually going to sell some parts of that and some of it will be sold as lower value or will just be thrown away or used as bait and all those kind of things. So it means that you're taking kind of everything unselectively out of the system and then there's not that much left for the wildlife. The other thing we think about is how much fish we're taking. So there's, there's kind of never going to be a situation in which massive super trawlers are going to be a sustainable um, method of fishing because we just need to be controlling the amount of fish we're taking so that there is still enough left for wildlife and other species to thrive and for the fish stocks to be able to replenish themselves. And then the third thing that we think about is whether it causes damage to the seabed. So methods such as bottom toed trawling and dredging have quite a lot of contact with the seabed, they'll drag along the seabed and they'll damage the habitat itself. So as well as sort of taking all of the species unselectively, it also damages the habitat which supports those species and risks the ability of that habitat to recover and produce more fish in the future. So Cumbria Wildlife Trust is working with fishermen on something called the Cumbrian Creole Project which is where we're helping fishermen to transition from trawling for nephrops, which is the primary method by which we catch nephrops in the Northwest, and for lots of the reasons I've said is very damaging, and transition to creeling, which has been done successfully in the Scottish sea locks for langoustine, but had never been done in the open sea. So there was a pilot project in 2019, um, and that showed that it can be done sustainably as a fishing method and as, as a part of a diverse business. And then we're now in the phase where we have two fishermen with 
200 pots each who are starting their commercial creeling seasons this year and part of my project will be supporting them to develop the supply chain and raise awareness about that and really help them to make that a sustainable part of their long-term business. So I've got a little video to show you that I'll explain um, the project. Hopefully I've got time. Sorry if I don't, Claire. Um, and this was made after the pilot project in 2019, but it really explains some of the concepts quite well. And if you have any questions at all about kind of where the project's at, what's happening next, then I'd love for you to put them in the Q&A and I'll come to them at the end. The Creel project is a, a project that we've been wanting to do for a long time. Something that we feel is really important because not only are our seas, the important species and habitats that live there being threatened by unsustainable fisheries, but also the livelihoods of coastal fishermen are being threatened because of declines in you know, fish populations and also rising fuel prices and things like that. And the Creel project is a really great example of how fisheries and conservationists can work together for mutual benefit. A sustainable fishery is a fishery where you're, you're thinking about what you're catching, how much you're catching and how you're doing it. So we're trying to only catch what we need, catch larger individuals that have had a chance to, to breed and reproduce and to catch it in a, a low impact way so we're not damaging the habitats and the other species that live in that area. So when trawlers go out, the nets go in and they sink to the seabed and often multiple nets drag across the seabed, sweeping up everything in their path. But when we use creel pots, they sink to the seabed fairly slowly and they just rest on the surface. So we're working with small scale coastal fishermen in Barrow and Furness and Whitehaven to undertake a project to look at the feasibility of creel fishing for longestines on a commercial scale and we've been able to show that it does work and we've been able to catch large high quality prawns that would have a high market value. So now we're looking to develop this project and test it on a, a wider scale and we're also hoping to work with the local communities to help them understand what's out there in the Irish Sea and what their local catch is. The sustainable fishery is very important because obviously you're looking into the future and if I can catch and return fish at the same time, obviously in the long run it's going to, we're going to benefit, benefit from it. Dolphins, seals, there's all kinds of life. In the pots you get all different types of species like wrasse, lobsters now and again, whelks, you get all different, different types of fish. It's amazing what, what life is out there. The benefits of my catch, with me being a day boat, it's fresh and you can't really, you can't beat that. Obviously my catch is as fresh as possible. It obviously demands, a, in my eyes, it, dem it demands the top, top money for the produce I'm supplying. I'd say the perfect day would be when you get up mid middle of the summer, you come down, there's not a ripple on the water, and then you head out and you just plod away all day. Whether you catch fish or you don't catch fish, it's just a bonus, it's nice to be out. Thanks, Lucy. That was great. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. So if anyone has any questions about any of that or any of the projects, then please put them in the Q&A and we'll come to them at the end. And I shall hand over to Claire. Thank you. And just while Jamie is getting his screen all sorted, I'll just give you a little bit of background information about Jamie Ribbons. So Jamie, if you want to get your screen sharing and then we'll we'll give it a few minutes. Um, Jamie grew up in Galloway after moving down from Glasgow at the age of seven. Um, he had a keen interest in angling and natural history growing up and that pushed him into a career uh, working in wild fisheries. So following being educated at both Glasgow and Edinburgh University, uh, he returned to work at Galloway Fisheries Trust on a salmon radio tracking project for a couple of years. And then in 2002, he took over as the senior fisheries biologist at the Trust. Um, and I've just worked out that's actually 20 years. So you've been there for 20 years now, Jamie, that's amazing. 
and uh, his particular interests at work are researching and addressing acidification, understanding fish population dynamics, completing habitat restoration projects and rare fish research and management. So are you okay, Jamie? Are you ready to start? I think I'm ready, Claire. Thank you Great, much. thank you. I'll just leave you to it. Yep. Okay, thank you. That was a very interesting talk as well from Lucy there. So I'm going to talk Okay, so I work for Galloway Fisheries Trust, as Claire's just said, and we work across the, the north part of the Solway. Most of our work is within fresh waters. We work across most of the rivers, including the, the River Annan, which isn't shown on the map here. Um, but we also work into the estuaries, and, the, and my talk is basically going to be focused towards the, the north part of the Solway. So I'm going to focus on some of the more interesting fish species that travel through the local estuarine habitats. Um, there's a wide range of different species, as you can see in pictures up here, including things like flounders, fifteen spine sticklebacks, a uh, range of different species. The, the estuarine habitats are very important and they support a lot, lot of important species. As a habitat, it's very varied. You have the changing tides coming in, going out. You have different salinities at different parts of it. So it's a very variable changing habitat for, for anything to live in. For fish to travel through it from the fresh water to the saltwater environment back again, it puts a huge physiological impact on a fish. And they, they help regulate this by, by using what's called osmoregulation. So for instance, if you have a young salmon, a salmon smolt after two years in fresh water wanting to travel to sea, and their big issue when they go into the sea is actually dehydration. So their bodies have to change. They have to start drinking a lot of water. Their kidneys adapt to reduce the amount of urine that they produce. Their pumping cells within their gills have to adapt and actually go into reverse. So they pump sodium out of the, or out of the gills instead of in. Otherwise, they literally dehydrate. So it's a very complex. That's obviously just a very brief summary. But it's a very complex change, and it's quite amazing that fish that actually travel between freshwater and saltwater through their estuarine habitats, just what they have to go through. So my talk is going to focus on four species, the European eel, three lamprey species, two shad species, and uh, sparling or smelt. So first up, we're going to talk a bit about eels, the European eel. Remarkable life, life cycle that they have. So all European eels all go and spawn in the Sargasso Sea, which is in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. Following spawning, the eggs and then the, the early life stages when they first hatch out take up to two years to relatively passively get moved by the tides um, from the Sargasso Sea to Europe. They hatch on the way and they grow as they head towards the rivers till they become what's known as an elva, one of the names that most people should recognise, and they, they enter in, into rivers. So they, they don't home to particular rivers, they just get washed passively close to the river and then they choose to enter and, and swim up and into the river. They can live in the river for up to 20 years, becoming particularly large over that time, before coming silver and then trying to repeat and basically go back to the Sargasso Sea. But if successful from birth, from, from when they've been spawned to going back to the Sargasso Sea, they will have migrated over 8,000 miles, 13,000 kilometers, and they all the way back um, to, to spawn. Fascinating fish. You can see with this next slide here, um, the, the sort of transparent, very young life stages of, of eels, which largely get carried by currents uh, over towards, towards Europe. And the picture on the right-hand side is actually small elvers entering the Kikubri D, which is near Kikubri. There's a, a large fish ladder at the bottom, um, concrete structure, and these eels are going up a, a perfectly vertical um, surface, which is covered in moss, and they, the, literally thousands of, of these can be seen in early summer 
heading up the fish pass. It's a particularly long fish pass and it's not suitable for, for eels. It's not been designed for eels, so they actually find it very difficult to get through any of the, the, the top passages to get washed back down. Um, but at the right time, you will see thousands of these, these elvers trying to get up and up and into the river. So from a local context, we do a lot of lech fishing and most freshwater environments will have um, European eel, eels living within them. They particularly focus towards the lower rivers, so eels are struggling like many fish species and as they enter the river, in, in some ways you need the high numbers to push them up and into the river. So what we are seeing already is, is, is a real shortage of European eels in the top of river systems although the lower systems are still supporting healthy numbers. Um, on the North Solway, there's two major rivers that have no eels or very few. That's the River Annan and the Kakubrisha D, which are two of the larger river systems, but because of man-made structures in the lower reaches, eels struggle to get up into those. So there's a considerable large area of habitat that, that isn't utilized by eels. Um, there are eel ladders, eel, sorry, passes going on to the Annan this winter spring. So that should bring them back into the Annan. The D is more problematic because eels leaving the D would have to go through the hydro system. And, and eels are particularly vulnerable to going through hydro systems. Interesting fact with regard to eels is that they can be classed as narrow or broad headed. These picture the right hand side there. There's two different morphs and they adapted for particularly for different feeding. So the narrow heads are feed on small soft prey, invertebrates in particular, while the broad headed eels eat larger and harder prey items such as fish or mollusks. And that means that they can help reduce the amount of competition between different eels and it's selective pressure in different habitats as well. But it's, it's quite recognizable and the amount of muscles in the jaws can vary between them as well. So that's eels. Even more interesting now, we go on to, on to lampreys, and we have three different lampreys that we typically find in and around the Solway rivers. This picture here is a brook lamprey and shouldn't really be in this, this talk probably because it spends all its time in, in fresh water. Um, but it is the, the typical sort of shape. So what's so special about lampreys? Well, Lampreys have no fish scales, they have elongated bodies, they have no paired fins, they have a single nostril in the very top of the, the, the nose, they have seven very simple gill holes along each side of their head, literally just like a space, they have no bones, they have cartilage instead, which, which they produce a flexible skeleton from, they have no jaws, they're a jawless fish as well. And they're said to be one of the most primitive vertebrates alive, uh, living in the, in the world today. And as we said, we have three different forms. So these are these pictures are adults. So that the brook lamprey, this first one here, actually spends all of its adult life in fresh water. And at no point in its adult life does it feed at all. So, so once it becomes an adult, um, there is no feeding. It's basically just its aim is to, to spawn and then die shortly after spawning. The next, the next lamprey that we have is the river lamprey. It's up to about 30 centimeters long normally. They are very abundant in nearly all of the rivers around the Solway that we work in. And there's a bucket here of lampreys that we collected while doing some work, work for smolts with some smolt nets. They can be in quite high, high numbers. Um, they are, so these, when they, they live most of their life in the sea and they have suckers, you'll see in the next picture what the mouthpiece looks like. And basically these latch onto fish and rasp through the flesh, particularly on herring, sprats and flounders. And they rasp away at the flesh and that's how they feed. And they are common across the soilway. And you will re quite regularly see them in the river. People often think they're eels, but if you have a look, they're quite, quite different within the sort of structure and the shape. Now, the really impressive lamprey that you get is the sea lamprey. And again, it's found in all solar rivers that, that we work on, in the lower reaches mostly. They can grow up to a metre long. 
they again they rasp onto fish so you can see this very impressive mouthpiece here of teeth so once they latch on they basically rasp away into the side of the fish and they typically will feed on herrings like cod salmon and sea trout so some anglers have reported to us before you can see the photos of a circular wound that's on the side of the fish they rarely kill the fish that they feed the on um, but but they do leave a very open wound when they drop off and particularly a lot of report on the Anne and the Nith border esque, the lower Cree we've seen on the Blandock and the Ur as well. And these are quite rare and protected species um, and very noticeable. If you see these, these, these large adults, you should know what they are. All lampreys breed by producing nests. So these photos aren't the clearest, but they're taken in local rivers. You can see on the left hand side there's a, um, a wee river lamprey there picking up stones so they use their suckers to pick up stones and, and produce um, a, 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 um, a sort of indentation at the bottom of the river where they spawn particularly the brook lampreys and the river lampreys will spawn in spawning masses and, and they lay all their eggs and then they literally lift the rocks and stones back over this all happens in early summer the picture on the right hand side they are quite noticeable when you look when, when you know what you're looking for, but you can see them in a lot of local rivers and streams. You'll see these small areas, maybe about 12 inches wide, very clean, where all the rocks have been placed back over. And that will be lamprey spawning beds. Again, they have a fascinating life cycle. Um, th these are called amacetes. So these are the larvae. So once the eggs hatch, they live in silty areas like the photo in the bottom right hand picture there is typical where you can get hundreds of juvenile lampreys living. They live in the substrate, they are filter feeders. You can see from the photos, they have no eyes. So they have no developed eyes, they're living blind, they, they evade, they avoid light so that it drives them down and in, into the silt. Silt is not a good place to live as it can be very mobile as a habitat, but they can move around even though they're blind and access in, into new areas um, and they live for up to five years in the silt so the majority of their life is actually as a blind juvenile living within within substrates and then suddenly their eyes do develop they become silver and they come out of the silt and they're called transformers at that stage they they, they wish to migrate and they head downstream if they are sea lampreys or river lampreys the brook lampreys don't become silver they, they do develop the eye same as that first photo that we showed and then they, they literally do not feed and they all they can do is spawn before they die but the other two 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 forms head off to sea where they start to feed on small fish particularly start with and then slowly getting larger and larger fish for a number of years before they will come back into the river one thing is it's not great to be a lamprey. They are extremely popular with predators. The top two pictures, if you follow the Dumfries and Galloway Wildlife page um, on Facebook, you'll see numerous pictures of the otters that, that everyone films around Dumfries. And I would say that from the pictures I see that probably their main prey item is lampreys when they're available. You can see they're eating one of the large river lampreys and a smaller um, sorry, large sea lamprey and a smaller river lamprey. P pike, they're very popular bait for pike anglers, and that's a pike that I caught a few years ago, regurgitated out a lamprey uh, when we were unhooking it to return it. And we regularly get reports of dead sea lampreys at the bottom of rivers rolling around. Most of them will have predator marks on them. They are very, very easy to digest. They have no bones, they have no scales. They don't have spikes like sticklebacks or anything like that. So it, it, it is a popular um, prey item for many, many species. Uh, shad next. These are members of the herring family. Extremely rare fish species around Scotland, but are found within the Solway. They eat small fish and um, invertebrates and shrimps. So they eat quite small uh, food items. They can grow quite large, up to 70 centimetres for some of the larger ones, and they produce about 200,000 eggs or so. All of the records that we are aware of from the Solway have come from the netting stations. 
particularly the salmon netting stations, which have nearly all been closed down either by angry interest buying them or by Scottish government um, closing them down for conservation reasons. So we don't get any records at the moment of, of um, shad. But when the nets were available, we got particularly large numbers from the Cree, but also lesser numbers from the Annan, from the Ur. We've never heard them being caught by anglers in the Solway, but we'd love to hear if anybody's aware of any being caught. They are hard to, to distinguish between the identify the different species, and you also can get hybrids between them. So the, the best way to identify them is actually to count the number of gill rakers. So if it's a twait shad, they have between 40 and 60. If it's an alice shad, they have between 90 and 130. And interestingly, particularly around Solway, there's a very high number of hybrids, uh, Alice Twait hybrids, and they literally the number of gill rakers are halfway between the, those two figures. So when we used to get these um, shad provided to us by, by netsmen, we would identify the different species. Um, we also were particularly interested as biologists looking at their gonads. So what we're really interested in was were they likely to be spawning locally? And what we found was yes, in that we found a lot of very gravid, um, particularly mostly in the Cree, very gravid shad. And then we would have a period of about 10 days where we wouldn't have any caught in the nets and then they're all spent after that. So we have all the evidence to suggest that there is spawning going on locally from the Cree, but we had great problems trying to identify where. And we never have identified where yet. So we, uh, we had a girl that worked for three years on various rare fish projects, and she spent a lot of time, you can see Liz at the bottom there, um, looking and trying to look for evidence of, of eggs. So she believed that they spawned in mid to late July, which is later than many shad populations, but that was what suggested with, with this different spent and unspent ones that were caught. She spent a lot of time going and taking samples and trying to find just one single egg was what she was after. And she never did. So all the evidence suggests that the shad is there. Alice shad is particularly rare species, um, but is looking for needle and haystack. There is no netting now, which is a shame. eDNA, which is a very exciting uh, tool for, for identifying fit fish with, within waters, is a potential that could be used in the future to try and identify whether shad were there or not. Um, we've never had anybody see spawning shad in any of the rivers um, on, on the on the Solway side where we work. If you read the reports of people that have seen them in other places, they, they thrash the water with their tails. They're like rotting pigs is another description. So they, they're meant to be very obvious to see when they're going through spawning, but we've never heard of anybody report them and we never managed to catch a juvenile anywhere yet, just the adults. Okay, my last fish, because I think I'm going to type for time now, is sparling or smelt. Totally my favourite fish that there is in the world and that we work with. Um, also known as cucumber fish. They have a very, very, very strong smell of cucumber. If you're working with them or when there's many fish around, you can actually smell it within the air. There is only one known population left on the west coast of Scotland, which is the population in the Cree. It used to be in every Ayrshire River and Solway River. Um, there is an inner Solway designated marine conservation zone on the Cumbrian side in 2019, and we helped write a management plan. Um, and that is based on quite a low number of juvenile sparling being caught uh, within that area. So there probably is more populations around. Um, but the Cree is the, is the most well-known studied one. So they spend most of their time in the estuary and in the salt environment. They grow up to 30 centimetres long on the Cree, which are some of the largest recorded sparling uh, in the UK. They are predators. They feed on invertebrates and small fish. But interestingly, they are very weak swimmers. They, they can do a short burst swim, but not prolonged. And when it comes to spawning, they need to spawn in fresh water and brackish water. And to access fresh water, 
because they're being weak swimmers, they utilize the high spring tides to actually carry them on mass on the front of it to get up and into the fast water because they need fast water because they basically disperse or spawn and so they release high numbers of, of eggs, sticky eggs, um, and the males smilt at the same time and they need high velocity water to split up these egg masses, uh, spread them out, fertilize them uh, and, and um, for them to stick down. So they need to be in water nearly fast and they can actually live in. So they use the tide to lift them up. They do have a problem with the spring tides that the water temperature is often too cold for them. Uh, water temperatures drive so many, so much fish processes and they need the water over about five degrees. So some years they get held back. And when they're around, there is a big reaction from the local predators. You see large numbers of cormorants that the most herons we ever seen was 19 at one point when there was some daytime spawning going on in, in one place. Um, because basically what they do, they come in, in in high numbers. So they come in in these very large shoals, they rarely through the day. So we've got some photos through the day, but normally they come in through the night. They come in their thousands. They spawn over just two or three nights. They get lifted up by the high tide and they, there is high activity for a very short time until they get washed back down. You get up to 50,000 eggs per large female. So if you imagine there's thousands and thousands there, you have a huge amount of eggs produced into quite a small area. And it is a pretty amazing sight to see. And whenever we can, we try and get out there and, and see it if we have, have a decent year using, using lamps and, and, and to watch activity. You'll see here, they are quite easy to see in the water. They have this sort of gray silver, silver color. The substrate where they spawn is all covered in eggs. So the, the, the rock being held in this picture here, the white, the white eggs are actually dead eggs. And you may just be able to see in the rest of the picture, just on the side of the screen. There is, there is see-through eggs all over that rock as well. They're the ones that are, that are alive. All of the substrate is coated like that. Um, and they hatch out after a few weeks, dependent on temperature. And the very small larvae is the picture at the bottom um, heads off down, down into, into the estuary. And, and that's where they grow. Very vulnerable populations. Um, as a species, you know, they all come on mass. They spawn in a very short, small area. Um, very predators can make a big difference. If you have a pollution episode during that time, it's not a great survival sort of strategy. And, and we are concerned um, and we, we, we run various projects and Claire's worked with us on some of them. A key one for us has been public awareness. So we have produced leaflets, we've done talks, we, 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 we continually remind and, and highlight them, particularly with regard to some of the planning issues, particularly flood prevention schemes. That was when we actually got very concerned because some of the proposals were, were the decimated their spawning areas. We're going to schools, trying to help the new generation coming through, understand them. We run events, people, are very interested in them typically. We have tried stocking. So the, the bottom left hand picture, we, we stripped a few hundred fish into the fleet, uh, which is about a million eggs we put into that river a few years ago. And it doesn't appear to, to have worked, but, but it, it may be the numbers may just be lower that, that we haven't had a chance to get in there to see yet. But um, we also do quite heavy monitoring. We collect some samples every year and we look at age classes, particularly missing age classes and what growth rates are, are, are like, just to get an idea about how vulnerable or, and how well the population is doing. There is no netting now for them. It used to be quite heavy netting in the past on the spawning beds, which, which obviously could, could have wiped them out. Um, but yeah, lovely, fascinating little fish, and hopefully in future they'll spread back to all the rivers across across around the Solway um, and back into Ayrshire. Is the hope? That's all my talk. Thank, thank you very much. If if you're interested to know more about what we do, then please follow us on Facebook, or we have new sections on our website. Uh, just just Google us and, and follow the new sections of that. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Jamie. I think that um, some of those images will have left those with a sensitive nature with um, nightmares, <laughs> especially that lamprey mouth, as Naomi quite well pointed out. It looks a bit like Alien. <laughs> and also the pike regurgitating one is a bit scary. <laughs> I never tea yet. Good pictures to get. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we can... Um, move on to asking some questions now. Lucy, do you want to put your camera on as well? We can run through some of the questions that people have asked. No. <laughs> so, well, the first question that came up, and you know, we can't necessarily answer all these questions, but we'll try and get through as many as possible. But the first one that came up was actually, what is the maximum water depth in the Solway? And I did try and Google it, but I can't actually access the internet on my phone. So I'm not sure whether anybody actually does know any, and knows that one, Jamie, Lucy, any ideas? I don't know Not specifically sure. for the to, Solway. <laughs> I was about to Google it as well. <laughs> it's quite shallow most of the Solway. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I think we can probably say that it's very shallow, apart from when it gets obviously further out round the west um, from like Mull of Galloway area, in which case it gets, it obviously gets a bit deeper, but you know, I think it's, yeah. we can say, say confidently it's very shallow. <laughs> Yeah, don't have that answer. So. No, there you go. no, I think moving on. <laughs> moving on, moving on. Do you want to do the next one? Uh, yeah. So another, there's, there's a lot of good technical technical questions here. Um, there are lots of uh, no, numerical questions. Um, how many trawlers are active at present in the Solway Firth? I don't know. It sounds like it's a Lucy question. <laughs> yeah, I can either. try and answer it. I don't know exactly how many boats because lots of the... Um, trawl fishing that happens in the Solway Firth and in the Irish Sea in general is kind of boats from other places than Cumbria coming in. So lots of Northern Irish boats, also lots of international boats kind of come through and trawl there. So I don't think there's that many local trawlers, but there's a lot of trawling that happens and therefore being able to support local fishermen to do more selective methods is really important for kind of being able to yeah, support them to have alternatives to that. Great, thank you. And uh, just moving on, another question to you actually, Lucy, was um, Kate and Andy were asking about cetacean friendly creels. Is, there, is that something that, you know, is that something that are around? Yeah, so I think that's probably a bit of a mistake in how I described it, or maybe just a bit unclear, but the creel pots are very cetacean friendly. Um, they're sort of, small static pots things swim into it and actually there's video footage of like within the day that the pots are on the floor loads of different fish will swim out, in and out again so they're not kind of actually trapped there um but things will swim into it and then you bring up the pots and take what you want out from it and then re-release any juveniles or any buried females or any other species you just release them back into the sea so cetaceans wouldn't get caught in them anyway really um the thing that cetaceans tend to get caught in is the trawler nets so the the big nets that are kind of sweeping up everything and that's what cetaceans will get tangled in thank you and mm. um, we've got um a bit of a cryptic one um next from somebody who asked um what is likely to be causing bubbles in the sea at skimbenes bank and skimbenes just um sort of east of Silith? Sometimes swimming in there is like being in a jacuzzi, especially noticeable on a calm day. Any idea that some wood living organism? I did look at that and I wondered, because when you see sort of cockles just under the surface, as they rotate to kind of keep burying themselves in the mud, it does release bubbles. So sort of small bivalve species that are kind of burying themselves under the mud might produce bubbles, but I don't have a specific or definitive answer for that location. Do you, Jamie? Help. I'm, sorry. I'm not going to help at all. I'm sorry. I was looking at some of the other questions. There. <laughs> so, no, I, 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 no, I can't add anything to that. No, sorry. Oh, somebody's just put in the chat that continuous bubbles may be methane from coal beds. Oh, so that is interesting. As long as yeah. it's not a giant lamprey coming up out <laughs> of the sand, just <laughs> blowing bubbles at you. <laughs> That's right. With it, I don't think they do that thing. <laughs> <laughs> nightmares now I think it's your I'm going to um, ask the next question and jump to one uh, Jamie I don't know whether you can answer this one it's about Cumbria but it says do lampreys get up Cumbrian rivers and into the lakes would you know about that 
So I don't know directly, but but there's a there's a good population of, of lampreys through, throughout um, the Solway, so they should be able to access up and into the rivers, the the two migratory forms. So, but but any sort of a fall, they can't get over that. Um, so, so, so they can be stopped very easily from that. There are land, you know, non-migratory forms. I, that first one that I put the picture up. So, so one thing I sort of fibbed about when I was talking about the anna actually and saying that you know there was a struggle for for things like eels and lampreys into the anna. That there is quite he a heavy population of brook lampreys that because they spend their entire life within there. So, so I don't know personally about the Cumbrian rivers, but everywhere that's accessible, they, they should be in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's a degree of homing, but not entirely. So again, they, they, they will explore into new rivers as soon as, they, as soon as there is habitats. And because they like spawning, although in rock, uh, in stones, that the, the, the young would cry silt, um, that then even rivers that, that are quite silty and such like can normally have, have quite high populations. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question about um, the Creole project. Um, yeah. you, Lucy. I think um, it's really interesting actually to find out how, what you're actually doing and what can be. I think there seems to be a, quite a bit of concern about um, about that kind of fishery side. So, just a, a sort of wider question on, you know, how how is it possible to police um, some of the trawlers? So, with the project that you're trying to do, um, it, obviously because they can the the trawlers can come into the the, the locks and. Um, destroy the um, the creels. Is there anything that can be done on that on that front, or have you got any, any thoughts? Yeah, that? that's that's one of the really big issues that our local fishermen face. Is that kind of the mm -hmm. the big boats can tear up any static gear, and there's not that much that can be done to stop them, other than just doing it in areas which the trawlers don't go. Um, yeah. Specifically for this project, it the original plan was to have an area in the west of Warnley Marine Conservation Zone which is down near Barrow and then have another area which would temporarily be closed to trawlers for the trial near Whitehaven so that they could do the creel putting there trawlers wouldn't be allowed in and um, then kind of after a review period they could decide whether that was a thing they wanted in the future. Um, there was some initial resistance to that, so it was decided to start the project in west of Warnley Marine Conservation Zone. They'll do their first creel seasons there, um, and trawling isn't allowed there anyway. Trawling has been banned there since 2019. Um, and then through kind of knowledge sharing events and information for local fishermen, it's hoped that we'll be able to kind of build the support to get that kind of exclusion zone to allow creel potting to happen further north as well. So it's sort of one for the future pipeline, but it's currently in, in an area that's close to trawling anyway. I think it just shows the importance of what you're doing, you know, working with those those fishermen that will kind of work with you and see the benefits in it, really. So it's got to be a, a good thing, uh, even though it's a bit of a long um, road ahead, I think. So that's, that's really interesting. OK, Claire, do you want to go for the next one? Yeah, before I um, ask Jimmy the next question, Georgie, who works for Solway Firth Partnership, has just put in the chat that um, the Solway is rarely deeper than 50 metres, but D Beaufort's dike depths can reach up to 200 to 300 metres, which is the, the kind of um, the deep water channel between um, Ireland and the West uh, Rins. So that's useful to know, thank you. Um, but, oh, yeah, but Jamie, can you just explain to those people that don't know what EDNA is? Yes, yep, it's, it, it, it has a... Um huge amount of potential with, with regard to lots of surveying. It stands for environmental DNA. So, so the idea of this, and, and I'll talk more about from the fish point of view, but I know that, that people are looking at it all over the place, different things, but the idea is that fish as, as living creatures are, are shedding a degree of DNA at all times within the water. So, um, so it, the testing ha has to be able to pick up it at a very, very low level. But basically, if you take a water sample from a point uh, or a number of points in a, in a river or in a lock, then the, the analysis can pick, can recognise and pick up the eDNA from all the species that are upstream of that point. So it's particularly useful for concerns about things like signal crayfish being introduced into waters that instead of huge amount of trapping and, and hunting um, and, and looking for individuals 
you could take a water sample just near the bottom uh, and test it and it would tell you. Now, it wouldn't tell you exactly where it was, but it would tell you, yes, there is um, single crayfish in there or not. We've been involved in a few projects starting to look at it because it's still being developed and it's working well for some species and not for others. But it's amazing how sensitive it is. So SEPA uh, did some work in Loch Ken, which has a huge amount of different fish species in there. But it, it also, as well as the species that we knew were in there, it picked up sparling, lamprey and um, one other type of fish, which to start with came back as being that's ridiculous, they can't be in there. Um, but it wasn't, it's because they're all used by pike fishermen for baits. So, so it's actually picking up samples as small as that. Um, so it's still limited to being able to tell you the size of the population. And, and we have some strange reactions like, uh, strange samples, so a lot of granite, they picked up perch. We're not aware of perch being there yet. Um, but we're experimenting, this was two years ago, to see if they are in there or not, um, uh, of whether it's been uh, contaminated um, or false record. So the potential is huge that you could just take a sample. So what we're hoping is that we could test all the rivers around the Solway to see if sparling are there at the sparling time, um, instead of having to go out every night and, and, and check different tides, and, and etc. Same with the shad if we could actually get some evidence that showed. But again, it could just be the shadow actually in the river, whether it's spawning or not, but it has huge potential. Sorry, I'm wishing on, but it's no, a no, huge that's, that's yeah. really interesting. And I think that we've also um, been aware of it being used for like testing for things like marine invasive species. So Marine Scotland came down and took some samples from Loch Ryan, for example, to test for carpet sea squirt, which is a particularly invasive, um, you know, uh, engulfing kind of uh, creature and came back negative, but it's quite interesting, like you say, the potential is, is really, really good. Sorry, Naomi, on to you. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go for the questions about, it sounds like someone's been eaten by an alien in the background. <laughs> I hope it's not my, my squeak. Um, a question about sea, a couple of questions about seahorses, which may be one for Lucy, I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I saw those. Yeah, what, what's your view? Um, somebody's asked, um, are there seahorses in the Solway? Um, and one question is, they've been told that they're in the Solway near Rockcliffe, so. I don't suppose you've got any, any ideas. I've never heard of them near Rockcliffe, but I will be looking into that now because that's a very interesting tip. Um, we certainly have seahorses in the Irish Sea as a whole, but you tend to get them more kind of along the western south coast of Wales. Um, on, in Cumbria, we have a sort of related species called a pipefish, which is sort of like a long, thin um sort of if you took a seed horse and they're made at the shape of a pencil so they've got kind of little eyes and mouth at one end and a little tail at the other and you'll find them sort of in rock pools and they come up in the creel pots and that kind of thing so we have seahorse adjacent species but i don't think we have seahorses as far as i know okay you wouldn't think that they would be um, in the inner firth but you know interesting i think that the rock cliff that they were referring to may have been the rock cliff on the dumfries and galloway side rather than the rock cliff on the Cumbria. not the rock cliff marsh oh no, oh, no. Oh, I the rock cliff marsh would be surprising <laughs> which is slightly further out into the history yeah. not that it's still kind of relatively yeah. inner but it's a little bit you know probably a bit less yeah. but yeah <laughs> <laughs> um i'm gonna ask jamie i'm just there's a question here that somebody was saying that there's exploratory drilling taking place less than a mile from the Cree estuary, looking for gold, silver and zinc. And do you think there's any concerns about that in terms of kind of possible pollution risk? Yep, so um, it's very topical at the moment. Uh, if people aren't aware of it, there, there's a, a company that that's, um, uh, is potentially looking for, for minerals around or very, or, um, various as it says there zinc and, and, and different things gold and it's particularly looking around near Newton Stewart and it's also potentially going look around Gatehouse of Fleet and Dalry which are all areas that, that we are involved and in, in, in work around and we're aware that those are sensitive it seems to be most um, progress most round about um, as highlighted here around about the creation and, and we, we are concerned it's difficult because at the moment they're just doing exploratory drilling um, and that required very little consultation so they didn't approach ourselves or, or groups like us. Um, 
you only have to go into Ayrshire and there's all sorts of historical issues with, with mining um, and impacts on water courses and fish populations. So, um, yes, it's potential. We, we, we made some comments recently to a newspaper about to, with regard to the Creestery because as most of my talk, you'll have picked up Shad, Sparling, which there is a triple SI there for, for Sparling, uh, all the lamprey species, Atlantic salmon, sea trout, they all travel through there. Um, there's also a particularly rare species in the bottom of Palmyra, which is close to, to, to the site. So, so um, yes, you know, and, and we, we are aware and, and we're watching out, but we, we aren't, with regard to consultation, no one's approached yet, um, or sales or anything, and, and it's, un, it's unsure, it's, it's unclear how likely it is to go ahead or not. Mm -hmm. But I think the local communities got very involved, which, which is great question of company and stuff and, and, and we are awaiting when there'll be more information to, mm -hmm. um, to get involved in but I would agree that it's a, a, a huge concern about potential yeah okay risks. yeah one to watch thanks Jamie should we just do one more question each Claire do you think uh, yeah sure because yeah, um, we've got we've got loads of questions actually but we can't kind of get through everyone um uh, so just um, somebody's asked about cockling and commercial cockling. Um, wondered if that was still a problem um, in the Solway. I don't know if either of you got any any thoughts about that. Um, I know that the North West Ithaca do a lot of work on kind of reviewing when the like open cockle season is and, and what sustainable levels are. So I think it, it is managed and I think it's quite well managed as far as I'm aware. Um, so, yeah. I'm not sure. One question I just wanted to, to pull out before we finish though, um, someone asked earlier what other sustainable methods there are as well as creeling. So it's not just creel potting that we're promoting, it's kind of any methods where you can be selective so you can choose exactly which you take and which you release unharmed um, are at a fairly small scale and which don't damage the seabed. So I think they were asking about sort of cod and turbot and lots of those species can be caught with pole and line fishing and that would be considered really sustainable um, for shellfish like scallops and mussels and that kind of thing um, and cockles as well actually hand gathering is a really sustainable method so just to kind of it's not just creel potting don't worry there's lots of different options thanks Lucy shall I just finish with one question to Jamie can then I, just very can quickly can I just put in a really quick one yeah sure <laughs> um, what if we're choosing seafood to eat um what what are other like certain species that we should go to and some that we should avoid or is that a too much of a simplistic question or i think there's, or, yeah. <laughs> there's certain species that are very over consumed in the uk and the proportion that we import to eat versus what we fish locally is ridiculous it's something like 80 percent of what we catch we export and 80 percent of the fish we, we import so if you can try to avoid like the big five which is salmon tuna cod haddock and prawns then that will reduce the pressure on those species and if you can try to eat local species which are caught with selective methods then that's great but it's the kind of thing that like if there's a fishmonger near you, you can ask your fishmonger like, hello, what do you have that's lying caught locally? And they'll be able to tell you. And there's so many recipes online. You can get kind of any fish and someone will tell you how to cook it well. So um, yeah, get exploring and talk to your fishmonger. <laughs> don't don't eat right. shad, please. <laughs> don't eat shad, shad yes. Yeah. far too rare. <laughs> hungry now. Um, oh, the, other, the other thing you can do, sorry, is the Marine Conservation Society have yeah, a resource yeah. called the Good Fish Guide, which you can kind of search any species on it and it'll tell you um, like how to source it sustainably. So if you Google the Good Fish Guide, then that'll help as well. Um, OK, thank you. And I was just going to finish with just one final kind of question to Jamie. So I was just going to ask, um, do you think that uh, like wind turbines and obviously robin rigs in the Solway, are you aware of any kind of impacts it's likely to have on fish stocks or migration or anything like that? Very topical at the moment because of the big licences off the east coast of Scotland. Uh, robin rig was quite limited the amount of monitoring that took place there, which, is a, which was a real disappointment. There was some work with the rare species we talked about that actually was what funded some of the shad work to, to look at that because shad being herrings are, are quite susceptible to loud noises but 
Um, again, a lot of those rivers aren't, aren't really cl too close to, um, uh, you know, the shad population we're aware of doesn't particularly travel close to where Robin rigged. There, there is ongoing concerns from some of the rivers in the inner saltway about whether or not it's had impacts on um, their salmon populations because it links up with a rid quite a collapse in salmon catches, but it's not only on the inner solway, you know, it's, it's wider than that. And there is actually a radio tracking program that started last year that's looking at smoke migration from the Nith and from the River Fladnock. And one of the early results, which is interesting already, is that is that the Fladnock smoke seemed to, to migrate out the solway near the center. I think it was in the Nith ones on the outside. Um, and, and you know, we're not clear why that is. It could be, could it be that they're avoiding uh, Robin Rake, that the smokes from the nest and it's pushing to the close to the sides? That, you know, that's not a fact. <laughs> that's just a, you know, floating out a possible idea. Um, I know that when they were built, one of the selling points was that the sort of bases of them were like reefs and they created um, sort of new habitats potentially for fish and stuff. I also heard that there's quite an issue with huge amounts of cormorants. Um, using the structures, so, so you know, the benefits to the fish from the reefs might have been knocked out if there's hundreds of cormorants right round about um, using the handrails, it became, became a whole issue. So, robin rig is a pretty small offshore wind farm, um, so it's, it's, it's unlikely to have much of an impact, but there's a lot of concerns about these large offshore ones, both for birds and potentially for fish, because mm -hmm. the feeling is that the technology. And the tests haven't really been undertaken. You know, it's not a clear at the moment. There's some major research going on looking at migration routes of salmon and, and other fish species, mm -hmm. but the licenses have already just been given out. So, so it feels like some of it's it's jumped the gun a bit. So, so yeah, we should obviously be you know promoting lots of monitoring and you know research yeah. and see whether um, we can support that. I say I think it was disappointing there wasn't an awful lot done with Robin Rig. Because Robin Rig could have really been sort of the first one of the first ones that got built. There could have been a lot of research mm. and a lot of information. I still think there could be more stuff done than that, just the fact it's been there a long time. Mm -hmm. Well that might be Can I also perhaps. weigh in on that one? Mm. Yeah, sure. Um just that there's kind of a lot of research going on between the Wildlife Trust and the Crown Estate and various wind farm developers at the moment on how to make wind farms nature inclusive and um, because they sort of act as a, a de facto exclusion zone from trawling there have been some um, studies that have shown kind of benefits to biodiversity and the various marine species but it's very much kind of the jury's still out and there's lots of work that can be done but they're also not necessarily automatically a bad thing it's just as Jamie said we don't know that much yet yeah great thank you so um well thanks for to Jamie and thanks to Lucy for those great talks that was really fascinating I certainly learned loads and I'm sure everybody else did as well and I'm just going to um, pass over to Naomi for a few final words um, so yeah, just I've really enjoyed that. That's been great. Um, if you just a reminder, if you want to watch this again, um, or if you missed any from last winter, you can watch them again on YouTube. There's a link on the Solway Coast A and B website um, to our YouTube page. So um, do feel free to watch those again. And we'd also really like your feedback as well. So you can do this by replying to the email address that gave you sent you this link um, to the webinar. Um, uh, you can also post on social media um, for both Solway First Partnership and the A1B on Facebook or Twitter. Um, and obviously just um, keep in touch um, with my local catch um, through the website, Lucy, I think. Have you got a, a, some web pages? Yeah, so the website is Living Seas Northwest. Right. If you Google that, it'll come up. And also on all social media channels, we're Living Seas NW. That's great. And I know you're doing lots of rock pool rambles and all sorts of nighttime rock pooling and exciting sounding things like that. So lots to get involved with. Um, is it the same for Galloway Fisheries Trust, um, Jamie? Yep, yep, yep. definitely please. Yep. Mine. That's great. So um, thanks very much, everyone. And we hope to see you again soon in our next webinar.